Well, good morning and welcome to our worship service on this Sunday, April 26th. And of course, I'm pre-recording on Saturday, April the 25th with my friend Mike Parrington uh, in the sound booth. Uh, thank you for joining us on, in this online worship format. I want to read you an email that I received uh, last Sunday after our service. Uh, it is from Bishop Cliff Fletcher. Uh, he is our elected from amongst a, uh, a group of pastors in our denomination. He is elected as our bishop, and he emailed this. Hey, Daniel, the Fletchers worshipped with you guys this morning. Thank you. We really appreciated your worship leaders. They had such a nice presence, and they are quite gifted. Holly was fun, as was the Black family. Thanks for including so many in the service. Thank you for your message. It was clear, true, and helpful. And finally, thank you for the mention of the 40 days of prayer. Uh, we appreciate you. So uh, it was nice to have the, the bishop visit in with us, even though we didn't know. Um, and so if you are visiting with us, if uh, this is not your church home and you're just tuning in uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, welcome. We are glad that you're here with us. Uh, for those of our church family, I want to read another um, message I got this week. This was in the form of a text, and it says this. Hi, Pastor Daniel. I found out today that Mike McGuire's birthday is on Sunday. Passing this along just in case you would like to say happy birthday on your recorded broadcast. So sometimes uh, when we find out it's somebody's birthday here at our church on a Sunday morning, uh, we sing happy birthday to them. So this morning, uh, with just Mike and I here in the room, I'll sing happy birthday to Mike McGuire. No, I'm not actually going to do that, Mike. Uh, but happy birthday and uh, enjoy a special day with your family today. Uh, let's pray as we continue on and worship together as a church. Lord God, we thank you for this day. Uh, even as I was coming into the church today, uh, what a bright and sunshiny day it is outside. Uh, and what a contrast that is to uh, the weight and heaviness on our world right now. But it reminds us of your provision. It reminds us of your grace, uh, your gifts to us, and your sustenance over us and over our lives. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for who you created us to be. And Lord, we ask for your presence in each place we are at worshiping you this morning. And in your name we pray these things. Amen. Hello! Hi! Happy Sunday! We're excited to be worshiping with you again today. We're going to be singing Oh Praise the Name in the key of G. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled
Holy Spirit in the key of D. There's nothing worth more than will ever come close. Nothing can compare your unending hope. Your presence, Lord. Let's taste it and see that the sweetest of love. So I just wanted to mention a, a couple of quick announcements. Of course, uh, we send out on Saturday a full email uh, loaded with different announcements. So please take a look at that for a full list of different things that are going on in our church and uh, things that you can be involved in. Uh, lots of stuff online. Different small groups are happening. A new small group, uh, parents getting together uh, to talk about parenting issues is, is going to be happening soon. So uh, please look at the email for uh, a number of announcements. But I do want to mention two things um, on video here today. One is that uh, we're gonna, we are engaged in uh, 40 days of prayer and fasting. So uh, our denomination was to meet in May for our general conference. And this is all the pastors, uh, all the churches send delegates uh, to uh, our, our meeting once every three years in May, and, and we decide big picture stuff, we pray and we discern before God. Uh, that's what General Conference is in our movement. Um, this year it's not going to happen, of course, so it's been postponed a year, but preceding that, uh, we, the bishop was calling us to 40 days as a movement of prayer and fasting. And so... We wanted to still be part of that, so we did not cancel the prayer and fasting piece. In your email inbox, uh, each day we've been sending you devotionals written by different people in our denomination, pastors, lay persons, uh, lay leaders uh, from various churches, and they've been writing out devotionals and uh, giving us some prayer points to be thinking about as we take 
concerns before God about our country that we live in, everything going on in our world, but also uh, our denomination and our movement as we seek to build uh, the kingdom of God together. Part of our commitment as a particular church uh, was to take one of the 40 days and make it a prayer focus for ourselves. And so this coming Wednesday will be that day for us. And so we're asking our church uh, to, to come together and pray. Now, we can't come together and, and be uh, in the same space together, uh, but come together in, in spirit and in unity, uh, praying from where we are. Uh, we had, before all this uh, happened, we had thought to break the whole day up in half-hour segments and have people sign up for different times through the day that they would pray. That gets a little bit complicated when we're trying to um, connect just by emails and, and teleconference and things like that. Uh, so what we're asking is, if your name, uh, last name begins with A through L, uh, please take Wednesday morning and be praying. If, you're, if your last name uh, begins with M through Z, uh, then please take the afternoon and, and spend some time in the afternoon uh, in prayer. And then on Wednesday evening, I'm going to take the whole hour of, of the pastor's uh, prayer time and Bible study. We're going to spend that whole time in prayer. Uh, so please uh, feel free to, to join in with that. And right after these announcements, uh, Sue Jackson is going to be on, on camera and she's going to talk a little bit about uh, what it means to be fasting together as a church, uh, as the people of God. I also want to let you know that uh, our finance team has met and uh, a solution has been reached for electronic giving. Now, thank you to the church for your, your patience in, in waiting for this to, to come about, uh, but many thanks to our finance team for uh, the amount of time they put in, the research they've, they've done, They've looked at all kinds of different options. They've talked to different people. Uh, the solution is for uh, an e-transfer solution. Now, what that means is there's going to be no fees to the church in, the, in, in terms of the church's banking. Uh, so the church can receive funds electronically and there's no added cost. Uh, people using Tithely have noticed that it has a an added per transaction cost. There won't be a per transaction cost for the church uh, with e-transfers. There may be, depending on how your personal bank works, uh, there may be per transaction fees for you to send an e-transfer, uh, but that's, uh, that's something that uh, your own bank and your own bank account uh, it, it will be set up one way or the other. Uh, the way it will work is uh, Donations need to be sent to a particular email address. So donations at ptbofmc.ca. I've said that quickly. I don't want you to just take my words and type them in. I want you to look at the email that, that is sent on Saturday and uh, uh, look at the particular of that email address there. Um, but once it is sent by email, it's all set up to be automatically received at the bank. Uh, so there is um, full internal controls uh, set up and, and there's full division of information. So uh, only those who have been elected at our annual meeting uh, to um, be overseers of the list of uh, donees and amounts, uh, only they will see that information. So uh, this is well researched. It's a good solution. It's, it's a zero cost solution to our church. And so we think this is something that not only is, is uh, servicing a need now, uh, but will be something that can carry on um, even after all the, uh, the shutdown stuff is all over. So just want to let you know, live on camera, uh, that's all done. It's all set up. It's all ready to go. It's been tested, and uh, it's working fine and working smoothly for us. Those are all the announcements I want to mention that way. And... Uh, uh, let's pray together, okay? Father, we do thank you for this time that we get to share together. We thank you for uh, who you are, the story of salvation, 
the, the blessings that you give to us. Lord, I, I have seen emails and I have talked to different people in our church who have received contact or phone calls or cards uh, from different others in our church. Uh, we are responding well as a whole body of lifting one another up and encouraging one another. And Lord, I pray that this would continue. I, I, I pray that uh, as days turn into, into weeks with this shutdown period, uh, I pray that we as a church would still have that sense of connectedness, that we would have that camaraderie, that we would have that fellowship. Uh, we miss it not being together. We don't get to see each other's faces very often, uh, but we can be broad-based, still connected, and I pray that we would uh, share that together still. And very first and foremost, I pray that each one remains connected in strongly with you. Uh, let people carve out and find that time for personal devotions and spending time in, in the scriptures and in uh, private prayer and family prayer. Uh, Lord, let families not be so distracted with other things and with um, uh, reworking their routines uh, that they have lost time for you. Help them to find new time for you and, and different ways of spending time um, in your company and in your presence. Lord, specifically today, I want to pray for uh, some people who are, are grieving. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for Deb and Grant Morrison and uh, Aaron and Elizabeth and, and Ed um, as they have lost Letha and the, the funeral will be this week. Uh, we pray for them. And this is a very difficult time for a family to be grieving. Uh, there's very few people who are allowed to be in the same room together, uh, even in the context of, of a graveside service. So be with them on Tuesday uh, as they have that service. Uh, let them engage in the process of, of grief, but let them know that you are with them and you are walking through this with them and supporting them. Father, we also uh, pray for Lillian Vince. As her husband Stan uh, passed away on Friday, uh, very suddenly and, and entirely unexpectedly. Uh, our hearts go out to Lillian. Uh, many of us know her, and so we pray for her. We, we ask that you uphold her. And uh, Lord, in, in this time of, of devastation, uh, help her to know that you are with her. Uh, be her strength. Um, be her guide. Lord, we pray for our society <clears throat> and our world as it uh, lives through this shutdown process and all the questions up in the air about COVID-19 and, and what's happening now and what happens next. Lord, um, uh, show us a path forward. Uh, let us remain hopeful in who you are and let us remain trusting in your character and your grace and your love for your people and your world. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and is our Savior. Amen. Greetings from the Jacksons. Uh, these are certainly interesting times we're in. Uh, Susan's been cutting my hair for the last 45 years, uh, but this is the first uh, week that I had an opportunity to uh, reciprocate, albeit under close supervision. <laughs> uh, as church treasurer, I thought I'd just give a brief uh, update on the uh, church finances. Uh, uh, naturally, uh, our first uh, visual, uh, virtual uh, service, uh, March 22nd, uh, we had no income without the uh, traditional offering. But very quickly after that, the congregation uh, uh, found ways to give uh, uh, with, with alternate uh, means, uh, be it uh, mail-in uh, donations, uh, drop-off at the ministry center, or uh, electronic deposits right into the bank account. Uh, and uh, as usual, the congregation uh, responded generously and uh, uh, has, that that uh, uh, pattern has been maintained. However, the uh, uh, dip in income on our first service turned out to be a blessing. 
because with the uh, arbitrary all or nothing uh, eligibility rules for the uh, Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy Program, uh, we met the criteria for 75% uh, of our payroll to be covered by the uh, federal government for uh, uh, March and April. And uh, uh, we'll have another opportunity to uh, submit an application for May. So we have a lot to be thankful for uh, on the financial side. So now it's your turn. Good morning. We have received seven devotionals uh, seven Bible readings and seven praise reports to date. We are on day eight of the 40 days of prayer and fasting. And I would like to talk to you today about um, how this all started and to just do a little talk about fasting. So um, over a year ago, Bishop Cliff decided that we needed more in-depth prayer within our denomination. And he... Um, uh, asked um, Pastor Ken Roth, who is a retired pastor from Ottawa, if he would take this venture on. So Ken Roth wrote a letter to all of the churches, around 150 of them, and asked if they would appoint a person, a prayer point person, um, to this committee. So I was appointed from our church. Some of the churches appointed pastors and some uh, appointed lay people, such as, as me. So we have met on a monthly basis. We uh, pray for the needs of our denomination. And um, over this time period, the group has, has grown. It was very small initially, but now we have three groups. One that meets in French, uh, one from the East Coast, and one from the West Coast. So um, we were supposed to have this 40 days of prayer and fasting before the General Council, and as Pastor Daniel, and you all know, um, Pastor Daniel has mentioned that General Council has been postponed, and uh, with this, uh, they decided to carry on with the 40 days of prayer and fasting. So I just wanna read you a letter that Ken Roth wrote to the pastors uh, at the beginning of this. He said, before the pandemic, we were calling ourselves together to pray for the renewal of the Free Methodist Church in Canada. We are still doing that, but the context has changed in such a way that the need and opportunity has become more obvious. This crisis highlights our total physical and spiritual helplessness without God. Because we believe that together is better, we are encouraging the approximately 150 Free Methodist churches across Canada to join to the call upon him to show mercy to the world and to reveal himself as the healer, provider, and savior. We want to start with the renewal of the Free Methodist Church in Canada, that we will be refilled with his spirit and sent forth in fresh boldness, love, and power. And just to summarize this, we are, we are being asked to pray for God to defeat COVID in our land and to renew our denomination, with, which will result in revival in Canada. So you may have noticed that this call for 40 days is prayer and fasting. And this is something that we don't think about a lot, but I'm going to speak briefly about fasting. If you remember in Luke 4, Jesus was called into the wilderness, <clears throat> excuse me, by the Holy Spirit. And during this time, he fasted for 40 days while he was being tempted by the devil. Um, later in Matthew 6, uh, Jesus is, is talking about prayer. His disciples said, so how are we supposed to pray? And in the early part of Matthew 6, he says, Pray like this, and he gives us the Lord's Prayer. Then a few verses later, he says, and when you fast, so he's not saying if you fast, he's saying when you fast. So fasting is something that Jesus himself put in connection with prayer. So the time provided for us when we fast 
allows us more time to spend time talking with God, listening to him, and reading his word. So that is the purpose of fasting. It is to give us time. And what does fasting do? It focuses us and gives intent to our requests for God. And I want to just read you a little bit from Joel 2. It's verses 12 and 13 where he's referring to fasting. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rent your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. And fasting also brings breakthrough for whatever it is that we are praying for, and we know what we're praying for right now with our 40 days of prayer and fasting. Fasting is self-denial so that we can seek God's presence. We can deny ourselves one or more meals, as Jesus did in his ministry, uh, when he began his ministry, um, or we can eliminate fancy foods, as Daniel did, and you'll remember Daniel was taken captive from Israel and was taken to Babylon. And while he was there, the king wanted to cultivate him as being one of the people in his court. So he treated him very well, and he was being fed food from the king's table. But Daniel felt this was not the way to go, and he requested that he and his three friends receive fruit and vegetables and whole grains, um, just basic food. So this is often referred to as a Daniel fast, and that is also a fast. We can also fast activities. Um, sometimes we spend too much time doing something, and I can think of uh, computer games or games on your iPhone, or sometimes even watching too much television. So. Uh, rather than, and maybe it's not appropriate to completely eliminate these things, but we can reduce our consumption of these activities. I think the important thing for fasting is to ask the Holy Spirit what it is that you are supposed to fast and listen to what he is guiding you to do. So I'm just going to share that I felt that I needed to fast tea. I love a good cup of tea. Tea is my go-to beverage. It makes me relax, and it gives me comfort, and it solves every problem. However, that isn't what scripture says, and it's wrong to do that. So I am fasting tea to give me more time to be in the presence of the Lord so that I know who is my comforter and where my help and my relaxation comes from. So I would suggest that please ask the Holy Spirit what you should be fasting because we are now entering week two of our 40 days of prayer and fasting. One other thing, um, each church has been asked to cover one day of these 40 days and our church has been asked to cover it next Wednesday, which is April the 29th. So Pastor Daniel has made reference to this in his email letter that he sent out Saturday. So please refer to that and make a concerted effort to cover that day with more prayer because um, the bishop has asked if we would do this and I think it would be good to, to do as he's asked. So in closing, I'd just like to pray. Lord, heal and guide our nation through this COVID pandemic. And Jesus, I pray that you are not just our personal savior, but also the Lord of our lives, the Lord of the lives of each in our church, of our denomination, and of our nation. And I ask this in your blessed name, Jesus. Amen. Hi, boys and girls. Hi, guys. Pastor Holly and Sam here once again. And Sam, you're looking very intelligent today with your glasses what's going on i prefer the word studious oh studious yeah very good i bet this has something to do with the fact that we asked some of the boys and girls we thought it would be fun to answer some of their questions yep that's what i heard too holly did the research yep good for you so we thought we'd do that today 
And so is this your way of trying to look smart? Well, I don't have to look it. What do you mean? I am smart. Well, of course you are, but you're looking very much the part today. Well, thanks, Holly. All right, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, we got some good ones here, Sam. Oh, good. I love a good doozy. All right, our first question is from Amelia. Oh, I know her. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Age 11, and her question is, how many people are named in the Bible? I know. How many, Sam? Two. Two. Adam and Eve. Well, that's where it starts, but there's a few more than that. Actually, Sam, there are 3,000. Oh my gosh! 237 people mentioned in the Bible. That's a lot, Holly. That's more than two. That's more than, that's a lot more than two. Wow, well, boys and girls, can you say that number out loud? Show it to them, Holly. 3,200. 3, 237. Whoa! Now you know what else is cool, Sam? What's that, Holly? That 1,443 of those names are repeated several times. Oh, wow. So, example, there's four Benjamins in the Bible. Only four, eh? Only four, but there's 14 Josephs. Oh, my goodness. And 31 Zacharias. That's a lot. That's a lot. Ed, can you imagine all those Zacharias? No. No, not so much. So I thought I'd share a few more names with you. Pick a letter, Sam. Let's pick the letter Q. <laughs> Q. Fine. How about the letter C? Or how about L? Let's go with the letter L. Okay, so in alphabetical order, all the people in the Bible with the name of the letter L, we have Leda, Laden, Laban, Labana, Lachish, Lael, Lahad, Lahiroi, Lami, Laish, Lacham, Lamech. Okay, Ali, <clears throat> put a sock in it. That's too much. Sam. That's not very nice. Well, we don't want to hear about this all day long. Okay, well, I just thought you might want to know. Next question. We could go on for a while, couldn't we? All right, well, this question is from Tommy. Oh, I know him. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Tommy, he has a sister. He does have a sister. And, and a brother. And a brother. You're and a right. mom. You know a lot. And a dad. You're right, he does. And grandparents, too. Okay, Tom, uh, Sam. Yes. Are you ready for the question? I'm ready, Holly. The question is, this is a good one, how did God come alive? Hmm. Hmm. Up from the grave he arose. Sam, that's Jesus. Oh. But I think Tommy meant was where did God come from? Oh, okay. So I did some thinking about this, and I thought to look in John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning was the one who was called the Word. The Word was with God and is truly God. That's deep, Holly. I know, and it's hard for us sometimes to understand with our human minds that God just always has been. He's always been there. And even in the beginning, God was there. And so God has always been. Good question. Yeah, good, good one, question. Tommy. All right, you ready for another one? I'm ready. All right, this one kind of goes along with Tommy's question. This is from Kaylee, age six. Oh, I know her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does she have any brothers? Yep, only brothers, no sisters. No sisters, you're right. Well, Kaylee's question is, I know God created the earth, but how did he do it? The very first part. Hmm. I don't know. Well. A whole I, lot of shovels. There was a lot of digging. Well, actually, Genesis 1, verse 1 and verse 3 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said... Do you know what he said? No. 
God said, let there be light. And there was light. God didn't need a shovel. All he did was he spoke. And he said, let there be light. And that was the beginning of him starting to create the earth and everything in it. That's so cool. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. All right. Well, this one goes along with that. And this is from Vienna. I know her. That's Tommy's sister. That's Tommy's sister. Vienna's five. And she says, how do God and Jesus get their powers? Ooh, do they have rings? They're not like superpowers, like Superman or Spider-Man or anything so no like capes. that. No capes. Hmm. They're just powerful. Whoa. And this kind of goes along with Rosalind's question. She's five two, and I she, know her. Yeah. 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 What do you know about Roz? I know that she's a girl. Yes, she is. She has a sister, a baby sister. Yeah. Not so much a baby anymore, but she's pretty little. And two brothers. Yes, she does. Yeah. Yeah. She's real cool. She is very cool. She likes cool. soccer, you know. She does. Yeah, she plays. Wow, you know a lot, Sam. Yeah. Well, Roz, she's age five, too, and her question says, how was Jesus able to feed all those people? So Vienna has been wondering, how did God and Jesus get their powers? And Roz is wondering, how did Jesus feed all those people? Do you know what Roz is talking about in that question? Um, when Jesus fed all those people with fishes and loaves. Yeah, over 5,000 men. That's a lot of people. And then women and children with just five loaves of bread and two fish. I don't like fish. No? No. You remind me of somebody else I know. His name is Rob. Oh, sounds cool. He's a pretty cool guy. You'll have to meet him sometime. Someday. Anyway, both of those verses talk about God... Or both of those questions talk about God and Jesus having their powers. And unlike a superhero that just has some superpower, God and Jesus are powerful. There's verse after verse after verse in the Bible that talk about God and his power. And something that has helped me to kind of think about this is found in Job chapter 11 verses 7 and 9. And at Circle of Friends on Wednesday night, we talked about sometimes God is mysterious and we can't always understand everything about him. And Job 11, 7 and 9 says, Can you solve the mysteries of God? Can you discover everything about the Almighty? Such knowledge is higher than the heavens. And who are you? It's deeper than the underworld. What do you know? It is broader than the earth and under the sea. So God and who he is and how powerful and mighty he is, is so much bigger than what we can understand. It's bigger even than the depths of the sea and the oceans. But we can know that God and Jesus both are very powerful and have the ability to do miracles, like feed 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fish, to create the earth and everything in it and so much more. That is so cool. Isn't that neat, Sam? It's kind of like the great mystery. It is. Yeah. You're right. It is a great mystery, but we can have faith and to know God through his word, the Bible, and to learn more about him each day. And that's why asking these questions is so great, too, because it can help us understand and know a little bit more, just more about who God is. All right, I have one last question for you today, Sam. Okay, Ollie. We have more questions from the boys and girls, but I don't think we can get to them all today, so I think we'll do this again next week. What do you think? Are you game for some more questions? Fun, these are good. These are doozies. They are. So, boys and girls, if you didn't hear your question today, we'll ask some more again next week and answer them, all right? So this last question is for you, Sam. For me? This is for you. I'm not in the Bible. No, but... They just wanted to know. Okay. Okay. This question is from Alicia. Oh, I know her. And she is age three. Three years old, eh? And her question is, can Lady Deluxe Shaver Sham play with Sam? Play with me? She wants to play with you. I don't know. I think you might have a gr girlfriend. <laughs> Lady Deluxe Shaver Sham, I think, is Alicia's sock puppet. Oh my goodness. And I think she wants to know if the two of you can play together. Well, the answer is yes, of course. Yes. 
Yeah. I, I have like a... friends. Yeah, you like friends? Yeah. All right. Well, maybe I can help you out and we can make a phone call to Alicia and Lady Deluxe Shaver Sham. Oh, that would be so nice, Holly. And you guys could maybe have a video chat together and play a game together. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Well, it's been fun answering all these questions with you, Sam. Yeah, it's been fun, Holly. All right. Well, we'll do this again next week. We'll see you. Have a great week, everyone. Bye, guys. See you. Bye. <laughs> we'll be singing Your Glory in the Key of D. So at the beginning of all this COVID distancing, I was concerned about what to preach on. Uh, I didn't want to be just another voice in the overcrowded sector of people who are talking about the virus and the shutdown. I was worried we might, uh, as a society, in fact, quickly hit uh, a high level of saturation, if it, as it were. Uh, wherein uh, the next person who talks about this, I'm going to just tune out because I can't take much more. And so the first couple of weeks, I wanted our online worship to be a bit of reprieve from all that. Uh, we were at the tail end of Lent. Uh, Easter Sunday was right around the corner, so it was Good Friday. Um, those Sundays initially served as a healthy distraction for us, or at least I, I found it uh, helpful as a, as a distraction for me. But now that Easter is over and the world is growing weary of the shutdown, nervous of the virus, and uncertain about the uh, changes that might happen in our culture as a result, I think we do need to look carefully at Scripture for some guidance. And so we began last Sunday with the question, did God send this virus upon our world? 
And my basic point was this. No, he did not specifically anyway. What is consistent with Scripture is the understanding that this virus and so many other harmful things in our world are the result of the overall brokenness and initial curse released upon the world by human sin. Therefore, it's not a matter of which catastrophe is a product of whose sin. Rather, it's a question of how do we live in a broken world? Uh, so we tackled that question last week. Well, this morning I want to address a different question, and it's this. What is an appropriate Christian response to all this uncertainty? Okay. What, what's an appropriate Christian response to all this uncertainty? Never in my lifetime, at least, has there been so much uncertainty in the world. I sat down uh, this week and compiled a list of uh, those questions. I, I've, I've heard them from our own church leadership. I've heard them from people I've spoken to pastorally. Uh, I've heard uh, different questions mentioned in the news and in media. I, I want to list them here with you so as to articulate what we're all sensing and living through uh, together as a society. So... There are lingering questions out there right now about infection rates. Is this as infectious as we initially thought? Is it worse than original estimates? Estimates? Is it less than original estimates? What about illness and recovery rates? Do more people recover than were originally guessed at? Are the mortality numbers higher or lower than what we first thought? Have people gotten the virus and escaped entirely symptom-free? Have we flattened the curve? And if not, when will that be achieved? And if we have flattened it, will there be a resurgence? And if so, when's that going to happen? Were we prepared enough in advance? Is there even such a thing as being prepared enough for all the crises that could fall upon the world? Or have we overreacted? In other words, have, have we brought more harm than good by shutting down our entire uh, society? Or have we underreacted? In other words, could we have done more to save more lives? How are we going to get out of all this? At what point will we begin to reopen our society? And if we pick a date on the calendar to reopen, are there going to be people who uh, break the rules early and, and do things that are, that are beyond what they should be doing? Or perhaps will there be some people who hold back from full engagement because they're still concerned about their personal health and safety? And what about the uncertainty of those who have lost employment as a direct result of all that's gone on? On my desk in my office, I have a list of nine families from our church who have been affected by job loss as a direct result of, of the shutdown from the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and scare that's going on. Uh, that list of nine is soon to be ten, and those are just the ones I know of. Uh, my guess is that some of you haven't even told me uh, what you and your family are going through. But it begs the question, what's in store for these folks? Is their job going to be guaranteed return to them at the end of however long this takes? And if not, are they ever going to find a job in the next few years within this economic climate? And what about those who are just now graduating from their schooling and ready to enter the workforce? What kind of prospects are going to be available for them in terms of jobs and careers? And then what about the great big societal issues that a, a, ma a massive nationwide, global-wide shutdown raises? I had someone this week tell me that they're convinced uh, the handshake will disappear forever as a personal greeting. Is that going to happen? Will we forever hold people at a distance if we don't already know them? And what about authority in this new landscape? Some suggest that governments have overstepped their authority, mandating businesses to shut down to their own detriment. Others say governments haven't done enough to enforce compliance. 
So we're now issuing fines and there are stories of people reporting on their neighbors. Some say there are elites profiting from everything that's going on. Others are reading end times prophecy into current events. That's a long list of lingering questions, isn't it? And even in writing them all down, I was very tempted to shorten it, but I left it in that long in an attempt to articulate all the things I've heard people saying these past few weeks. There are so many questions out there about what we are doing right now and what it will look like for us to come out on the other side. Regardless of your own personal level of uncertainty in these matters, and I, I certainly am aware that there's a whole variety of different opinions on each of these issues. I want to think with you about an appropriate Christian response. And so I want to do two things this morning. First, I want to affirm with you something. And then secondly, I want to remind you of your call. So first, I want to affirm with you that uncertainty is okay. Just a little more than 12 months ago, it was last January, February, and March of 2019, we were into a sermon series here at our church on the Psalms. We proposed that there are broad categories that each of the Psalms fits into. Uh, they are not my categories, but rather uh, were proposed by scholar and theologian Walter Brueggemann. The first category of psalms is this. There are psalms of orientation, which are, are praises to God when everything is going right. Life is good, the author is grateful, uh, everything is, is going well. That's category one, psalms of orientation. Category two can be called psalms of disorientation, something has happened, a tragedy, an enemy, friendships destroyed, a betrayal. So often in the Psalms of disorientation, the author does not even name the evil, but all these Psalms talk of a very different phase in the author's life. Stuff has gone wrong and uh, they are suffering through. Psalms of disorientation. The author crying out to God because of what they're suffering. And then finally, category number three are the Psalms uh, of reorientation, where everything is back in its proper place and God is praised because God has seen the author, author through uh, his trials and difficulties. Right now, I think we can relate to those psalms of disorientation. It's basically the same thing as uncertainty. And these psalms have a particular job. They do not answer the, the questions that you're currently walking through, but they affirm your right to ask them. And they affirm your relationship with the one true God who does know all things. Perhaps the well, most well-known of these psalms is Psalm 23. Listen to this psalm of disorientation, this psalm of uncertainty. Yet hear the trust in God behind the uncertainty, okay? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The author's sense of peace, do you notice that here? 
the author's sense of peace does not come from the valley of the shadow of death being solved. That's not what he's grateful for. It hasn't been solved. He is walking through it currently, presently, as he's praying that prayer. Rather, the point is this. Even though he walks through that great uncertainty, whatever it was, he does so in the full assurance of his relationship with God, that it is solid and it is steadfast. Parents, let me speak to you for a second. Moms and dads, uh, you need to be talking with your kids. You need to ask them how they are processing uh, all this stuff that's going on right now. Uh, I know, as a parent, you are working hard to keep a sense of, of normal for your children. You keep up routines of meal times and doing online schooling and whatever else you're attempting to do at home to uh, make things normalized uh, for your kids. But they're not sheltered from it, are they? Uh, they will have heard things. They've picked up on things. And they, they may have quiet and private fears which they don't know how to process. And don't just assume that they're going to ask you these secret questions that are on their hearts and their minds. They might be embarrassed to ask. They might be ashamed to ask. They might even think it's a fault within their own heart if they wonder these things. So moms and dads, don't be afraid to sit down with your kids directly and, and ask them, say, how are you processing these things, kids? What are you thinking about all that's going on in the world? What have you heard? What do you know? Uh, what questions do you have? Are you afraid of anything? What can we help you with? And just as you don't expect them to have all the answers, nor does your Heavenly Father expect you to have all the answers right now. Uncertainty about what comes next is part of the human condition. It is perfectly reasonable. It's perfectly understandable. Allow your children to voice their concerns just as God has given us words to voice ours. On today's webpage, uh, we're going to put a link uh, to a one-page quick reference guide that will point you to the Psalms uh, with these three categories of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation in them so that you yourself or maybe even your family can together uh, can say some of these prayers of uncertainty before God, voicing your concerns while affirming uh, your trust in Him. These psalms are written for us uh, for just times like these. The document's going to be a PDF file uh, listing out all those uh, different categories, and you can find that link uh, on this YouTube webpage. So then, if that's the affirmation, what is the reminder we need, the reminder of our call? Well, I think we need to be reminded of some words from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, probably all the words from His Sermon on the Mount, uh, but I mean a specific section. In Matthew chapter 5, and, and again, I, I hope uh, in, in these online services that you have a Bible with you, uh, maybe a family Bible with you, and, and open it together as we look at the Scriptures. But Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 uh, to 16. Here's what Jesus says to those who are listening. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and, and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And then it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In a world where questions turn into concerns, which turn into fear, it feels like we're called to avoid that path, right? We're called to avoid that path of fear even leading to depression and, and, and all those ends. We're called to be salt and light. 
Now, let's be careful to do our due diligence in Bible study here. Is Jesus really speaking to us today in these words? When he says, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world, who is he talking to? Who is the you? Well, it's the people who are gathered to hear him with a purpose to follow him, listening to his words and then following his words. That describes the crowd on the hill so many years ago, um, but it really does also describe us, doesn't it? Learning to obey everything that he commands. That's who we are as well. So this command calls us into that work of the kingdom of God in our world. Be the salt, do not lose your zest. Be the light, do not hide that light away. Let your good works be seen so that what? So that what purpose is fulfilled? So that people will give glory to your heavenly Father by seeing you in action. There is no permission here <clears throat> to despair. Be salt and be light. And do good works so that people will glorify God. Uh, except if you're scared. Then it's alright for you to turtle in on yourself and fixate on your own problems. Is that what it says? Be salt and light, except for when there are troubling times, except for when you're uncertain, except for if you don't know what tomorrow holds. No, there's no exceptions. There's no qualifying statements here. There's no permission for that. Our call is clear. We will have an optimism about us. We will speak words of hope into the uncertainty. We will conduct ourselves, not pretending that everything is fine and nothing has gone wrong, but with a sure confidence that we may not know answers about what happens tomorrow, but we know the one who does. God, our Heavenly Father. And so we live lives of trust and confidence and assurance that whatever happens to change the world around us, God is consistent of character. He is steadfast in love. He is full of grace and mercy. And redemption defines Him. So folks, as His people, be free to tell God in worship and in prayer the concerns of your heart. It is not a weakness in faith to do so. Even tell one another for the sake of uh, mutual support and prayer. Encourage your children to be open about their fears and concerns. Uh, that's a healthy response versus holding everything in. Use the Psalms uh, to articulate uh, what's going on internally as you process uh, all the uncertainties in our world right now. But then also remember that we are called to an active faith. We are called to be salt and light. They are things which are noticed. They are things which are not to be hidden. Good works are all the more relevant when people are bunkered down. So, our privilege is to trust God with the concerns of our heart. Our call is to be a proactive blessing in our world, even when it is a little fearful to do so. Because in the end, we all want the same thing that people would glorify God, our Father in heaven, at least in part because of the good works they see in us and the light they see from Him shining through us. Amen. Hello! We'll be singing The Stand in the Key of G.
So thank you again for joining in with us this morning. Uh, parents, really take that seriously. Uh, sit down with your kids. Talk to your kids. Make sure they know they can ask you questions uh, in those moments or, or any other times. Make sure there's open channels of communication and be, be asking them pointedly about it. Uh, folks, also be using the Psalms. These are the times that, that Psalms are written out of and these are the times that the Psalms are written for. Uh, so be using those and I, I hope the quick reference guide uh, is helpful to you. Uh, but let us end our time of worship uh, with these words from Jesus. Uh, when times are in, uncertain as they are, uh, which we might even call uh, dark times, here's what Jesus says. But let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Thanks for joining us.